What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Today, we got a special guest on. I always say special guest. Let's say we got an interesting guest on today, a guy that was doing some things on that that computer on the dark web, and now he's heading to federal prison. Colby, tell the people who you are. Talk a little bit about you, brother. Hello, my name is Colby John Cop. Uh, I'm 24 years old. You know, I never thought I, in a million years I would ever be in this situation, but you never know where life could take you if you don't have a plan. And I didn't have a plan, and look where I ended up. So, you know, you're you're on your way to federal prison, right? Yes. Tell the people why you're on your way to federal prison. The reason I'm on my way to federal prison is because I was indicted for a conspiracy with intent to distribute 400 grams to 1.2 kilograms of fentanyl. Now, that's a federal charge, right? So the feds charge you on one thing they're able to charge you on. I moved much more than that, but they weren't able to prove it in court. The reason I was charged with intent to distribute fentanyl was because I was pressing pills with fentanyl in them, and then I was distributing them on the dark web for profit. You always kind of like a computer guy or no? Um, believe it or not, no, I was introduced to this world not only a few years ago by a couple of my friends, not, you know, not like vending, but just ordering stuff off the dark web. I mean, you know, I was a, I've always been like a nerdy slash athlete. You know, I did really well in school, 4.0 GPA. I always played a ton of sports, football, wrestling, you know, track and field, cross country, you know, and then once I graduated high school, I had my little clique of friends and we always would hang out and, uh, you know, kids being kids, we want to get our hands on weed, right? So one of my friends, let's call him Ty, right? He shows me some weed he has one day and I'm like, Ty, no offense to you, brother, but you don't have the social skills to go get weed this good. You know, you'd have to go to like um, a city. We're from a small town. You'd have to go to a big city and know somebody to get this. We're on the East Coast. You know how it goes with weed, right? So he's like, I didn't talk to anybody. The postman brought this to my house. I'm like, what are you talking about? The postman brought weed to your house. Are you fucking crazy? He said, no, let me show you. He pulled out his laptop, went on the dark web, went on one of these markets. He said, give me $200. So I cashed at him $200 and he ordered me an ounce of weed and sent it to his house and then gave it to me six days later. That was my first introduction to how this stuff worked. Were you worried about getting on that dark web? As a user, not really. I mean, you know, unless you're buying like kilos and kilos of cocaine or fucking tens of thousands of pills, you don't really have to worry about the cops coming after you for reselling. Like if you're buying just for personal use, like they don't really care about that. The thing you have to look out for is getting scammed, right? So there's an ecosystem online where you're able to verify if someone's legitimate. So are you aware of, of Reddit, right? Of course. Of course. So on the dark web, there's this site called Dread, which acts, it's basically Reddit. It's a clone of Reddit, but you know, they can't have Reddit on the dark web. So on that website, you're able to go on there and interact with people and be like, hey, where's the good weed vendors? Like who's bought from this person or where's the good coke at or where's the good heroin or wherever, whatever you want. You can get credit card information, anything. OK, so you're on there. You check out the source. You're kind of like, hey, you know, let's check. Let's look into this a little more. But you get involved in this big conspiracy where you're pressing pills. How does this happen? Does someone come to you and be like, yo, we need your computer skills? Or they're like, yo, bro, we need you to press pills. What are you doing in this conspiracy? So you know how I alluded to earlier how my friends and I, we started ordering our personal stuff off the web, right? The hubris of a young man, I realized, hey, guys, why don't we start selling weed, right? And then that eventually evolved to why don't we sell acid? And then acid evolved to molly. And then I met, you know, more and more people I started working with. And one of the people introduced me to their dad. Now, their dad was working with a group of local, a uh, local MC club, right? And they were moving a lot of uh, blow. So I meet the dad and he's like, 
gave me a hundred dollars. He's like, order me a gram of the best Coke you can get off of there. He said, if it's good and you could get drugs off there, I will make you rich. So I do that. It comes in. It's, 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 it's like, it's right off of a kilo. It, it's, it's amazing. So he sees it and we start, you know, we partner up together and we start moving blow. Um, the reason he wanted to partner with me was because his suppliers, the bikers, they got indicted because the uh, leader of the biker gang was crazy and he was already being investigated by the DEA and the ATF. They got him. So my business partner needed a new Coke supplier and I was able to fill that. Which was he buying at a time? <laughs> We get up to a half kilo, kilo, depending on the week. And this was a, every week. What was your profit? <laughs> uh, I don't want to say exact figures, but a lot. When you say a lot, I mean, people are listening. They want to know. I mean, you're going to jail for it now. It doesn't matter. I mean, it's water under the bridge. So tell us. I want to know. Because so I'm going to go cocaine? somewhere with this question. Huh? I'm eventually going to go somewhere with this question once you answer it. I mean, you know, we would make sometimes fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a week in profit because we would get the coke and then we would cut it because you know it was really good compared to out here in Connecticut. You could cut that right in half and double it and double the money. So take one kilo and turn that into two and then break that down. At any time were you getting high yourself? Yes. Yes. I, I eventually developed an addiction to cocaine. Are you still high, getting high now? Be honest. No. No. I've passed every single one of my drug tests. That's one of the reasons I'm able to be on self-surrender. You know, I had asked you, and I said, I'm going to ask you another question. So you make, you know, you're making good money. You, you obviously develop your own addiction. You're on the dark web. You're navigating. You're meeting people. You're networking. How much money you got left? Because you're getting ready to go to federal prison. How much money you got? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Some people might think you're lying, but I know that we talked and, and you kind of told me that. That's why I was asking you how much money you made and how much you have now. Well, I mean, millions of dollars were generated on the dark web. If you were if you were to total like my local sales of cocaine and then pressing the pills, eventually when we get the idea to go on the web ourselves as vendors, millions of dollars was generated. But at the end of it, you don't you don't you don't get anything. You don't keep anything. For every one dude that gets away with it, there's a thousand that get killed, lose everything, or are put in jail, or die. You think people are dying that are doing business over the dark web? Some people are. Some people are. So you're on this dark web. I mean, are you getting better with computers? Because I know you said you're kind of like a nerd slash sports guy. Were you getting better with computers? Oh, yeah. I mean, I studied computer science in college, but... You know, I, I was learning more and more about the specifics that I needed to facilitate my crime. So remember how I said before, we were just ordering cocaine off there and then reselling it. Well, eventually we wanted to stop that because, you know, moving, you know, two, three kilos at a time, <laughs> you want to stop that, especially in a small town. Shit's going to get hot, especially when you have the best coke around. So. We cool off for a couple months. I just live normally. I have a ton of money saved up. I'm still working a normal job. And then one day, my business partner calls me and says, hey, come meet with me. I, I got an idea to discuss with you. So I go over to his house and he's like, listen, if we're buying all this stuff off people, like who's on, like, is the cartel on there? Like who's on there? I'm like, well, I don't know literally who it is. All I see is like a vendor handle. Like when you go on Amazon and let's say buy like, you know, like a Swiffer duster, you just see some a uh, handle for like a random store on Amazon and then you're buying that product and leave a review. That's exactly the same type of ecosystem and it's there for selling drugs. So he asked me, he's like, well, how do you get on there? Like, is there a verification process? Like, what do you do? And I'm like, well, if you're just a Joe Schmo off the street, you got to pay some money probably give some shit away, you know, to get a, to garner a reputation because everything's reputation because it's all in, it's all anonymous. And then, you know, if you have a good product and you're able to be competitive against the people, you'll do well. It's not like selling drugs in person. Like drugs are the appeal themselves. Like if you have good cocaine, 
you're going to get sales in person. But if you have good cocaine on the internet, you have to also be a good businessman because there's 20 other people that, that any customer could just go to. They could just search and there's 20 other competitors that they'll go to. You're, you're getting this stuff in the mail, obviously, right? You make an order and it comes in the mail? Yes. U, USPS only. Look at any postmarks or try to figure out where it was coming from? What do you mean? Like the stamps on the, on the box or on the envelopes or however it's being sent. Are you like looking to see like, hey, man, did it come from California? Did it come from Texas? So you know the general vicinity of where it's at, but... The people actually putting the stuff in mail are definitely not the people actually on the computer, you know, like dealing with all the orders. Like usually these are organizations of sophisticated people that are able to segment this. It's more so like an actual business. It's an organized crime. Where do you think it was coming from? The cocaine? We were getting it from, from uh, California and Texas. Eventually, you end up getting into this uh, fentanyl thing, right? Yes. Making big money with fentanyl? We made big money with fentanyl. I'm not making any money anymore with that. That's what I meant. I mean, were you making big money with the fentanyl? You know, at first it was slow. And then once we uh, once we got things going and gave away some stuff and verified who we were, we'd make twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 every day. So some people might find it hard to believe that you were making all this money and now all the money's gone. Did the federal government seize your money? So, yes. And also, in part, we were robbed by the stores we were actually transacting on. Um, the way it works is you have Amazon, right? Are you familiar with an escrow service? Yes. Okay. So the website holds the money. Let's say, let's say you want to buy an ounce of weed for me, right? You take $200 worth of Bitcoin, the website holds it. I send you the weed. You open up your package three days later, you like the weed. You go back on your profile and you release the money to me, right? So during this process, there's absolutely nothing stopping the website from just stealing the money and, and running away and shutting off the website. And that happened to me three separate times ask you this right because we're talking about this whole fentanyl thing and epidemic you know there's young kids dying every day getting high you grew up in connecticut did you grow up kind of in a good family you went to college yes i grew up in a good family you ever feel bad about you know when you pick up the paper or see the news that these young kids are dying on fentanyl knowing that you're involved in that I i've been wrestling with that um i think in my case in the advertisement that I had online, I specifically mentioned what was in my product, right? And also, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a libertarian, so I really believe that, that grown adults can put whatever substances they want to in their own body. Yeah, but we're not talking about just grown adults. We're talking about kids that are dying, right? Yes, but there are kids that are also dying from drunk driving accidents. And... I mean, understandable, but, you know, there's a bunch of young kids that are running around getting high on fentanyl. I'm not here to scold you or belittle you or downgrade you. I'm just asking you personally because, look, I was a drug dealer. I was a crack dealer. I regret it. And not just yeah. because I spent 18 years of my life in prison, but because now that I'm older, I can reflect and I can look at my community and say, man, I helped be a part of this. I helped destroy this. You know what I mean? I was the reason why some kids didn't get Christmas presents. I was the reason why parents were selling their food stamps and some kids weren't eating. And I do have a sense of remorse, you know, for people that I affected directly or indirectly. And that's what I'm asking you. Do you have a sense of remorse at all? Uh, I'm trying to come to that understanding. I'm trying to come to complete terms with, with, with the morality of, of what I did. I'm trying to look at it from the perspective of the government. I'm trying to look at it from my perspective of, of, of freedom. And I'm also trying to look at it from the perspective of a person who's addicted to drugs and from the people that they met that that may affect. Um, and I haven't really came to a conclusion yet, to be honest with you. Um, I, on, I haven't. I, I need to think of all those things, to, to be completely honest with you. How old are you? I'm 24 years old right now. No kids, right? No, sir. You got a niece or a nephew? Yes. Do you love them, care about them? 
Yes. Let's say they were 14 years old and they died on fentanyl. How would you feel? I would feel terrible. So you, we can agree that, you know, there's parents out there and cousins and uncles and aunts that have lost a family member and they feel bad. I mean, your feelings are your feelings. I can't make you feel a certain way. But, you know, I wanted to ask you that. And sometimes, you know, you're 24. I was 24 when I went to federal prison. Sometimes it clicks, man, later on in life. You might be sitting in prison and then it might click like, damn, man, I probably shouldn't have been doing that. But let's talk a little bit more about the dark web because, you know, when people see the thumbnail, that's what's going to make them hit this, probably the dark web. So when you get on the dark web, how difficult is it for a person to get on there to buy something? If you have rudimentary computer skills, I think almost anybody could get on the dark web. Um, if you know how to download a file and then open that file on your computer, you could get on the dark web as a user. And also, if you know how to just you have a basic understanding of cryptocurrency, you can then purchase things on the dark web. Ever worried you were going to get ripped off or did you just kind of do that Reddit thing and the dread and make sure everything was legit? So people did try to rip me off many, many times. So let me back up a little bit to get to the point to, to explain how I even got to the point where I was selling fentanyl. Right. The business partner I talked about before, remember when he was asking me about, hey, like if there's people that sell shit on there, like how do we get on there? Right. I said, well, you know, you pay a fee, you set up a store and you got to have something to sell. I'm like, we don't have anything to sell. Like, what are we going to do? And he's like, well, you know, out, out where I was living, I knew of some Mexican individuals that uh, were pressing pills using fentanyl and they were making a killing. So he's like, I, I think we should try that. And uh, stupidly, I agreed to facilitate that. And it took, it, took a, it took a couple months of planning, careful planning to actually put everything in place and then do it the right way. Um, so, yeah. You ever worried about getting busted? Ever thought about the feds? Man, I might end up in federal prison for doing this. Yes, of course. But when you're in the middle of crime, like it, it's more of like an afterthought. I mean, to me, at least, and seemingly everybody around me. I mean, maybe maybe in your experience, it was different. But you always think other people will get busted. It's never me. And then, of course, it's you. You, too. Anybody can get busted. I used to feel that way when I was selling drugs, like, I'm good, man. I, I ain't going to slip up. They ain't going to never get me. But I never thought about the wire taps or, you know, the people that are going to wear a wire on you. Never thought about that aspect. Always thought, man, I'm good. I don't have nothing to worry about. But when you're on that dark web, you're kind of like you're hiding behind the computer. No one really sees you. You probably feel like, damn, I'm good. You ever feel excited when you got on there? Incredibly so. Incredibly so. I think that was more addictive than like the substances I was on, like, knowing at least to an extent I was fooling federal intelligence analysts and it took them a couple months to actually catch me. I mean, people can look at that and scoff, but taking the FBI, taking them a couple months to actually catch you like that's, that's not usually they'll just catch people immediately, you know, but at the end of the day, I got caught. So you know, I flew yeah. too close to the sun. At the end of the day, you got caught, right? A lot of people, I mean, there's been some big names from the dark web. I mean, that one dude ended up with life, right? Um, what the hell was his name? It's on the tip Ross of Ross Ulsbright, the founder of the yeah. Silk Road. Yeah, so the old Silk Road guy, right? He ends up with a life sentence. His he family was the actual admin of the entire of an entire website. So I was just a person that would be on his website selling stuff. He's the dude that runs the actual website making billions of dollars. So Big money running through the dark web, right? Billions of dollars. Millions of dollars every day, billions of dollars a year. Besides drugs, what are the other things that you've seen being sold on the dark web? Exotic animals? Um, you know, So elk. specifically on the dark net markets that I was on, I would see credit card information, stolen logins of like Netflix accounts, um, like, like stolen uh, of gift cards narcotics of every variety and kind and then if you're a sick fuck there's other places where yeah i don't want to talk that. about that stuff on here yeah I, I will avoid that let me ask you this though so when your packages would come right how would they come in the mail would they be wrapped up in cellophane tell the people how they come my packages the, the, the drugs that you were purchasing, 
when they came to you in the mail, would they be hidden in like a helmet? I mean, it's in your PSR. I, I, I didn't read the whole thing, but how would you get your stuff? I mean, it shows up in, in the postal, but was it wrapped up? Did it have coffee beans around it? Like, how would you get so it? So they, they would they would wrap it in, um, they would like triple vac seal. If it was cocaine, they triple vac seal it. And then they would wrap it in um, some type of like, it, it's like, it's almost like film. And that deters x-rays because they x-ray every single package in a USPS facility. And then you put that in a flat rate envelope and that's, that's good. Ever worried, man, when you got your package that someone might be here to get you? I mean, no, because there's some telltale signs if you have a package intercepted. Um, if their package is ever delayed, it's they're trying to get you. Um, if you get a letter in the mail from the DEA, <laughs> they got your package, but they don't have enough evidence to convict you. So you better stop doing what you're doing. That's called a love letter. Let me ask you this. While you're doing this stuff, right, did they ever intercept any of your packages? So packages that we would send to individuals that actually bought them? No, not to my knowledge. But the FBI, of course, this is a public place where anybody could go to purchase drugs, right? So undercover FBI agents would go on there and they would purchase drugs for me. And they used that to start building their case on me. Um, remember how I alluded to that there is an ecosystem like on the forums and everything? Well, that ecosystem allowed the feds to catch me because people pretended to be certain types of people that could help me. And it turns out they were undercover federal agents. The investigation on you originally, or was it on someone else? And then it led to you. I was on somebody else and I, I believe it was on somebody else. And it led to me, I think. Is it all right if I post pieces of your PSR up? Yes. The information may, I'm not sure I'm going to do it yet, but I might. Just because I don't want people to think we're bullshit. I want them to know that this is real and it's raw. Um, so anyway, Kobe, let's talk about this now, right? Were you a little bit worried when you did get busted and now you're going to federal? You're like, damn, I'm going to the federal prison system probably. Were you nervous? Of course. I mean, I've never prior to this, I have never been arrested or in trouble, period. So the, my first time ever getting arrested was from federal authorities. In fact, you had sent me an email and wanted to kind of know about federal prison, right? Yes. And you left me your number and I call you. <laughs> it's, it's all right to talk about this, right? Yes. I call you and I think when you pick up the phone, you get nervous and hang up on me, right? Uh, honestly, yeah, I did. Why were you nervous to talk to me if you had reached out to me? The anxiety of, 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 of all of this coming together, realizing I have to talk to a person that's been there because I'm about to go there, it kind of got to me and I froze up. Because I know you had wrote me an email, and then I, I said, hey, I'll, I'll get a hold of you, and then I never did. And then you wrote me again, and then I, I said, okay, I'm going to call you, and then I call you, and you're like, hello? And I'm like, this is Chad, Blood on the Razor Wire TV, and you're like, uh, poop, and you hang up on me. And eventually, you end up talking to Matthew Cox. Um, you, I think you, you do an interview over there, and then yes. he shoots me your info, and I'm like, I know this dude, bro. Like, this dude wrote me and hung up on me, dude. And he's like, man, you might want to interview him. So that's how we ended up striking this up and getting this interview, man. Shout out to Matthew Cox for sending you back my way. But let's talk a little bit about the fear. What were you afraid of going to federal prison? Was it the movies you seen? Was it the stories you heard? What is it that bothered you that got you, you know, bottled up? Being a felon, having not being able to do certain things for the rest of my life, because in the federal system, there's, there, there's no expungement. You have to get clemency from the president. And I mean, there might be some laws that are coming, but they're not there right now. So honestly, not the act of going to prison itself. I think I could conduct myself there and be fine if I'm just respectful, mind my business, don't do, do stupid shit like gamble or gossip, right? But being a felon, that's the scariest part to me because it's the first time in my life I feel limited. You know, when we talked, you said, you know, I'm kind of like an athlete, but you told me you really, you're really not a fighter, never really been in fights and stuff like that. Were you worried about that thing? Damn, if I'm going to federal prison, I might have to fight. I might have to get a knife. Did any of that enter your mind? Depending on where I go, I was thinking like, if I go to like a camp or something, I don't think that that's going to be the case. But I think a medium and above, if people try to test me, 
from the friends that I have that have been to federal prison, they say, listen, even if you're going to lose, you have to fight. Because if not, you're in for you're going to be in for a miserable time. Ready to get busy if you have to. What do you mean by that? <laughs> and if someone puts their hands on you, you're going to fight back. I have to. I have no choice. Even if I'm going to get my ass beat, I have to. I'm not saying I'm tough. I'm probably going to lose, but I have to defend myself. Well, I'm not saying that you're going to lose, but you know what? I mean, you're right, but you'd be shocked at how many people go in there. They're felons, even for violent crimes. They get slapped. They get punched. They don't fight back. That's why I asked you that. I mean, the natural reaction is, hell yeah, I'm going to fight back. But what if four or five dudes press you and they want your commissary? What are you going to do? I'm going to give it to four or five dudes because they're probably a gang. <laughs> I'm going to give it up. I'm not going to sit here and say, I'm going to fight four or five dudes in federal prison. No one would actually do that in that situation. You'd be shocked, my friend. You'd be shocked. What, ha what happens to them? Um, I'm going to tell you what I would do if I were you. If someone tried to take my shit, I'm going to punch them in the face, bro. Four or five dudes. We're going to be fighting, especially because I know where you're going now, and you, you, you know where you're going, too. You're going to an all right place. I'm not going to say where you're going. That's up to you, but I know where you're going. But if, if a couple dudes pressed me in a place like that, I'm swinging on them. Um, you know, some people call you. Know, let's just, I'm going to keep it real with you, right? Other dudes got prison channels. They're like, oh, that's a check in move. Listen, man, if I had to, I'm going to jump on you in the, in the kitchen. Because if you're going to press me with four or five dudes, then we're out of here. I'm going to punch you in the face in the kitchen. I might stab you in the kitchen. I might do hit you with a lock in the kitchen. Because guess what? I'm not going to be out on the yard. They're talking about, man. Chad was fighting, man. He was doing good till they killed him. No, that ain't going to happen. I, I mean, well, I'm thinking like if there's four or five dudes, people can call that a check in move or whatever. But I think pressing me with four or five dudes, and I've been in that situation in Big Sandy where I fought four or five dudes at the same time, got my lips split open by a dude that was shot from the gun tower. But um, I don't know, man. Sometimes your pride, you know, sometimes your pride could get you killed. You know what I mean? But in a prison environment, man, you got to pick and choose. You call it what you want. I'm punching this dude in the face and we're out of here because I'm not going to live somewhere where they took my shit because next week, guess what? You're going to take my shit again or I'm just going to live with nothing. And you know what, man? That ain't going to happen. I, I, I'd rather not do that. But you're going to a, you're going to a, a, a I mean, never want to say prison is nice, but you're heading to a camp that's probably pretty laid back. And I think you're going to be all right and you're going to make it. Were you relieved when you found out where you were going? Yeah, just to have the clarity to, 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 to know what I have to do to reclaim my freedom and be able to to rectify what I did. That I like that. I like knowing that. Of course, I mean, not knowing you're always like, but when you find out that it's a camp, are you a little like, damn, it's a camp. It's probably, I'm probably going to do all right here. Of course. I don't want to go to a max. <laughs> yes, it is. Well, I know, but tell the people how much time you end up getting for this dark web conduct that you're doing. I got five years of border prison time five years probation, and a $50,000 restitution fine. What do your parents do for a living? My mother is a business manager, and I, I don't know my father. Is your mom upset about this whole situation? Of course. Is she worried? Like, is she afraid you're not going to be safe and all of that stuff? Um, No, no, because she consulted with a few of her friends who've been through the same thing. And once, you know, once they found out like roughly where I was going and they read my PSR, they were like, there's no way you're going to a serious place with your with your criminal offense level. There's no possible way. Well, you'd be shocked. The Bureau of Prisons sometimes does crazy things. But let me ask you this. What are your plans, man? You're 24 years old. You're going to go to prison. You got a five year sentence. Let me do the math real quick. You probably do about three years, two months with halfway house and, you know, all of that, the good time or whatever. Right. Five times two, ten. Halfway house, maybe a year. Yeah, probably somewhere around the three, three or four month mark, right? You get the drug program, you're really in good shape. What are your plans when you get out of prison? What are you going to do for work? What are you going to do as, as a career? Are you going to go back into crime? No, I never intend on going back into crime for the rest of my life. I learned my lesson. It's not, if, 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 if I could, if I'm talented enough to make millions of dollars on the dark web, I'm talented enough to figure out a business where I could pay my taxes, pay my my fair share to society, and do something constructive as opposed to just destroy people's lives. Um, what I intend on doing, I have. Let a me few stop you for a minute because what you just said makes me think that maybe you do have some remorse because you just said, "Man, I don't want to destroy people's lives anymore." Pretty much. So maybe you do have a sense of remorse. Maybe it's kicking in at 24. But go ahead. I'm sorry for interrupting you. 
Well, let me let me also address that point, right? Let's say you're the CEO of uh, of Newport Cigarettes. You can believe that people have the freedom to smoke cigarettes, but you know they're also going to get lung cancer. Like I'm not I'm not you know I'm not going to sit here and pretend fentanyl isn't going to cause any issues to people. Personally, I believe adults have the freedom to do whatever substance they want. But I, I do think the government should step in and legalize tax and regulate every drug. I think that would end the war on drugs. Well, I mean, I mean, that's your perspective, right? A lot of people feel differently. Um, honestly, bro, I wish there wasn't any drugs because there's so much pain and suffering, you know, from drugs in the world and kids going, you know, kids growing up without parents, kids not getting Christmas presents, people going to prison like myself for 40 or 50 years. And then, you know, young kids growing up without a dad, but you're right. We make our own choices. We have, we're not robots. We have the ability to make our own choices, but I think man, 13 and 14 year old kids, man, their brain's not fully developed and they decide, man, you know what? I'm feeling depressed. My boy, you know, he offered me something, man. I feel better. And a week later, man, they take a big one and now they're dead. They've only been doing it for a week. So it does bother me a little bit, to be honest with you, but it is what it is. So what are your plans? You're getting out of prison. What are your plans? Just going to get out and get a job? Do you have any goals? My goals are to start um, a couple of online businesses. I have, I'm partnered on a digital marketing firm. Um, I also want to start a couple of Amazon businesses. Um, I want to, I want to do e-commerce. Well, I talked to you off camera. I think you're a very, very intelligent dude. Um, you can say what you want to say. I respect it, but I think you got some money put away. And I think that you're going to do some things with whatever you got. Um, but hopefully, you know, I want your life to work out for you. You're 24 years old. You got a second chance. Some dudes at 24 don't have a second chance. So I'd like to see you get out of prison, man, do the right thing. And hopefully everything works out for you and do live a law-abiding life. Anything you want to say before we get ready to go? I want to say thank you for your time. I appreciate you giving me a platform to uh, – discuss my crime again i want to i want to talk about the ethics and morality of what i did i am still wrestling with that i am open to multiple perspectives i mean again people change as they age i may have made a mistake i don't know if i made a mistake yet honestly i think i did there's probably a reason the government wants to throw me in jail and someone like you who's been in a very similar situation has been on the side of selling drugs you're telling me that is destroying lives and it, it's doing all this bad stuff. It, it probably is doing that. And 100%. And you know what? I regret the choices that I made, not because I went to prison, but because now I know, man, it, this is what I did. I helped destroy things, man. I helped destroy the family structure. I helped destroy the community. You know, when people are out here robbing and, you know, it's just, hey, man, it's the, that's the life that I chose and I do regret it. And I'm sure that you'll be laying in that cell and you're going to regret it. It, it, it'll take some time, but you will. And I already see it in you a little bit. But anyway, man, I'm going to get ready to close the show, man, let you know that I appreciate you coming on, talking a little bit about the stuff that you've, you know, been involved in, the things that you did. And again, man, I wish you the best. I'm going to tell people, if you like what we're doing, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, Blood on the Razor Wire TV. Until tomorrow, we're out. <laughs>